today's coverage of the 7th Annual Thrive and Survive to benefit the St. Baldrick's Foundation. This tournament is run by and the presenting sponsor is Long Island Disc Golf Club. Thank you very much to them for helping us out with this video. Also, thank you to our Patreon family. If you'd like to become a Patreon, help support us for as little as $2. The link for that is in the description. But now to the video, I'm Dave Oster, joined as always with Rick Hansen. We have a special guest with us today, Adam Walsh from the Long Island Disc Golf Club. How's it going, guys? How you doing, Dave? Good to be here. Looking forward to some good golf. Adam, who we got on the card today? All right, so we're looking here at uh, Dylan Reese. Uh, Craig Henninger uh, for Wolfpack Disc, still in represented Discraft. Uh, up next, we're going to have local favorite Phil Rascona, uh, strong ultimate player background, came into disc golf this year. And Chuck Tuttle, someone who is definitely newer to our tournament, but we are very happy to see him on the lead card here. Excellent, and we'll see how these guys fare on hole one, par four, 586 feet. Pretty much straight down for your first shot, trying to get yourself a good approach shot. Maybe between these trees, if you're a little bit left, you'll have to contend with this big pine tree and then a pretty wide open green once you get down there. Yep, that sounds so about right. Getting off, the, getting off the tee, key, uh, the tee here is gonna be the key. The two trees that we saw there, about how far out from the uh, basket are they? Oh, that's, that's pretty much 500 foot mark right there. So, uh, oh, we got a great forehand roller from Craig here. We'll see, that's probably we're gonna curl up at around three and change, uh, but he does have a really straight approach shot right through the gut. And we see the scores from our players. This is the second round of the tournament, the Thrive and Survive. Adam, you wanna just explain a little bit about what the breakdown of this tournament was for this, this round and the last round? Yeah, absolutely, and with Phil coming in, that's the prime landing zone right there for it. Uh, so the Thrive and Survive is a annual charity event, and the format, uh, round one, we do alternate layout, very short, very gettable. Uh, you would call them part twos if you found them in the wild. Uh, that's your Thrive <laughs> round, and then uh, because Hexer's such a, a long and grueling course, uh, that, that's your Survive round. So we're not only just, play not only are we playing for the long positions, uh, but we even have some alternates and extended holes uh, featured in this layout. And I think that makes perfect sense why we see such low scores coming in to, if anybody knows this course, it is not a scorable course from the longs to the scores that we're seeing. So I just wanted to kind of get that out there off the bat um, and we see how these guys are doing with their upshots. Absolutely. Chuck seemed Chuck to land in an ideal spot. Yeah, that was looking nice. Unfortunately, somebody put those branches exactly where they belong. So that's going <laughs> to leave them, a, leave them an outside look, but more likely a chip and a putt. Uh, Phil here should be able to hyzer this right down through the gap. Yeah, that's, and you, that's, that's the design. And you said Phil just started playing this year, huh? No, no, no. So Phil, Phil's been with us. Uh, he's, he is a pre-pandemic golfer, uh, but he did come. He's got an experience extensive ultimate frisbee background uh and I, I assume he like most of us got tired of running uh and man <laughs> he found this golf uh I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing him play here today he uh, he has a tremendous style great power uh he, he really he really belongs out here uh Greg Henninger here with a uh, his signature turbo putt probably from about 55. oh broad Almost got that, there. That's impressive. Just off in the corner. I'm scared to throw the turbo from like five feet. Nice Ooh. putt. That's a nice hit. That, that that had to be from a pretty pretty central in circle too. I would think. He and he. I don't know if you guys caught it, but he took the back door. He didn't come down that uh, main main alleyway there. He came in through the back around the big guardian tree. Uh, but like what he found with that 45 footer from about 10 high. Yeah, it worked yeah, out. I think Dylan and I would get along great. Throw the forehand wherever it fits. <laughs> All right. Still cashing in from right around the circle. Uh, I guess the cameras don't bother him, which is nice to see. I gotta tell you, it does look challenging and long, but it also looks very gettable. So that's, that's always a sign of a good golf hole. Absolutely. Most of the holes on this course are, they're there. They're right in front of you. Uh, a lot of fundamentals. Uh, it's a, it's a great challenging course 
distance really does play a big factor here. So it's nice to see some of these uh, these guys with bigger arms are going to get a chance to really open up here. So that's nice. Yeah, and Dylan and Phil start right where they left off on round one, and we'll see if they continue that on hole two. Par three, 396 feet, pretty much open. The right hand, backhand shapes well. Couple guardian trees right by the basket, and one in the middle of the fairway if you're trying to go either lefty, backhand, or forehand, but shouldn't be a problem for these guys. Yeah, there can be some funny wind down here in the corner. It's a big open field, as you can see, in this corner that you're playing into, the wind will get swirly. So a lot of times, the first part of the flight is what you expect. The ending, maybe not so much. Try and get it where it needs to go and hope. <laughs> This is going to be Phil ripping on a crank here, uh, and if oh, it might push him up to that tree. That tree is going to be sitting at around 35, maybe 37 feet, so just at the circle's edge. All right, I didn't know we watched in the bags and we're supposed to know what the guys are throwing here. <laughs> like I said, it's, uh, it's, it's <laughs> nice to be local. It's nice to be local. So for a couple of guys, I'm, I'm hoping to guess right a couple of times here. They'll, they'll let me know in the comments when I guess wrong, I promise you. <laughs> Little turned over there. Ooh, a little early. All right. Yeah, I don't think that was the shot that Craig was uh, picturing there, but hopefully he cleaned it up with the approach. Framed up nicely between those two trees. There right. go. He's there. Well, thought he might try to dunk it in from outside, but looks like he'll be cleaning up that par pretty easily. Chuck's probably at about 60 feet here. We'll go around. Fair bid. Yeah. You can't make it if you end up short. That's right. That is that is the gospel. Dylan with a big tree. stretch around the tree. Yeah, again, trees being right where they belong is definitely a theme here. Flash out there. Clean ups. Finish these up for par. Of course, now that I said it, I'm worried about commentator's curse here. <laughs> I think they're all pretty pretty close. That was the last one I was worried about. I'm not worried about any of these. Yeah, that's right. And uh, we saw a couple birdies, but now that the course is showing its, its teeth, the survive is kicking in. So... Absolutely. And, you know, something to mention here, just because the holes on that front, you know, that first round are shortened, you're still walking the entire length of this course. So the, the you know, fatigue is going to play a factor at least uh, at some point, hopefully not this early, uh, but right. at some Ab point it, it may, it's a long track. Absolutely. And I don't know if we've mentioned yet that this round is a 22 hole round. So the fatigue, like you said, will definitely be a factor moving forward um, but right now we're on hole three par three 320 feet it's a right hand backhand uh, left to right shot if you can get it there maybe flex it out you don't want to flex it out too much because there is another bunker of trees to the right uh, a pushing forward forehand could also work and the basket is kind of tucked behind yet another bunker of trees so not a super long par three but definitely challenging it looks like it looks like the play is through the gap in a nice little flare skip around. Yeah, I think you got that right, Rick. It's uh, it's actually a straighter shot. So it's one of those fairways that, that tricks you into turning something more than you have to. Uh, a, a laser down the middle with a nice, you know, nice soft finish should leave you somewhere in the circle. Uh, but I'm definitely thinking there's some wind out there because it looks like both Dylan and Phil got those a little bit more turned, I think, than they had meant to. Let's see if Chuck can make a correction here. Looks like he tried to adjust watching them turn, start Agreed. out a little wider left. Agreed. And Craig will show you the forehand line, I think, here. Well, that's a nice looking forehand. Now come back. There you go. And, you know, backside, maybe 70 feet. He'll, he'll, he'll give it a bit, I suspect. Yeah, a little wider than he wanted, but he's safe. Nice uh, ground play out of Chuck. Like, yeah, that, that's very clever.
It's a real unique low hanging tree that hangs out right over where it looks like your line is. So from the tee or even your upshots have to be low liners to get all the way up to the green. Otherwise you're gonna leave yourself with a, a low ceiling putt almost where Phil just hit. You called it. Yeah, you called it right there. It basically <laughs> kept him from giving it a bid. He just had to toss it over there. Come on, get in there with this big turbo. Oh, uh, nice bid. He'll dial it in. He'll, he'll get there. He'll get it there. I got to tell you, full flex on a putt is a weird thing to see, though. <laughs> I know. It <laughs> is. I know, but for those folks who, uh, who play in this area, Craig is, uh, Craig is a well-known fixture on the tournament team here. Uh, big part of the Westchester uh, club as well. So those of us playing around here, we, we've seen that turbo putt quite a bit. And, man, when it heats up, it is devastating. I have a hard enough uh, Dave, time did you, uh, normal. Yeah. Dave, did you? Dave, did you ask all the players uh, to wear gray intentionally? Was that something that you, you thought would make make it easier for us to differentiate on, on film? Yep, I asked them. I really wanted them to blend in with the, the winter color of the trees <laughs> so we couldn't really see them on film. Um, but you're right. All right, now uh, if I can jump in here. So here we're looking at hole 3A. This is sort of a, a, a beta testing uh, opportunity for us to see. Uh, ideally, uh, you know, we'd love to see disc golf continue to grow not only uh, at Hexer but all over Long Island. So we're we're looking for new places within the park where perhaps we might be able to fit something. Uh, we got an overhand play here coming from Dylan. It looks like. How big is that gap down near the basket from the camera? I would say six to eight feet. Yeah, probably not as big as he would have liked it to have been. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, when we first walked up to this hole and the Ooh. path, oh, as Phil goes right down the path I was just about to talk about, you walk in about halfway down the fairway and the first set of trees you see are just like you said, no more than five or six feet. And you're like, oh my God, is this actually a hole? But then you go to the tee pan, it's like, all right, there's a couple lines you could hit. Yeah, trying a, a, a forehand turnover around the uh, right-hand side there. I didn't quite see where it ended up, though. Uh, looks like Greg's going to give that a shot, too. It does, it does look more open, at least in the start, so you might get down there a little further, but it looks tighter as it gets closer to the basket. Oh, big kick. Well, still finding some very creative airspace up there. Look at that. Ooh. Gosh. Out of position all the way into the bullseye of the circle. That was an outstanding shot by Phil. Yeah. Gramble. Yeah. Gramble plays a big factor here, it looks like. Oh, nice. Still finds a way there, too. All right. So it looks like there's more fairways than just the one. <laughs> Fair, fairways or local gaps, you That's make right. the call. <laughs> and Adam, you can take a look at this footage later and you can decide which fairway you'd like to pursue as this hole develops. <laughs> exactly. Now, this is, uh, this is valuable, uh, real-life data for us to consider. Ah, oh. oh, gosh. And uh, again, just kind of leaking off the edge of the basket there. And it looks, it's so clean of a putt. It... it it's almost baffling that it's not going in on, on these first couple tries. Yeah, no, I promise you. Effortless. He, he, he really, it, it's not a novelty option for, for Craig. It is his primary putting stroke uh, and, and rarely uh, does it leave him a, a problem. So even if it's not going in, uh, it's, it's not going far. He, he really does have a, a great touch with it. And still, right, if I'm not mistaken, like that was a par save. Wow. Way to go. Yeah. He was he was on a whole nother hole for a moment there. He he didn't like your fairway options. He chose his own. <laughs> he went looking for something Dylan. new. Dylan comes back to the field a little bit. All right. So after a couple pars, a couple bogeys move on to hole four. This is a the fifth hole of the tournament, but an actual hole four on the course. It's a par four. 423 feet 
couple of the trees in the middle, you can either go wide forehand, or I think a couple of these guys are gonna try to flex something to the right and come back where we're looking now, um, land somewhere around here, and then find themselves a clear lane for their upshots up to the basket. Yeah, that forehand lane down the left-hand side looked very tempting. Yeah, this is a uh, this is a very oh gosh, not 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 with that tee shot necessarily, but this is generally <laughs> a very birdieable par four. Uh, enough so that I was I'm 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 still hopeful. We'll see if anyone can squeak one all the way down there. Uh, maybe even an outside look at the two. And this right here, I oh, think, is sort of the pretty. prescribed. Yeah, that's the prescribed flight. Uh, just one one tree to miss there. In that case, he would he would have really pushed forward there. Stay out. Oh, goes inside. Okay. Adam, just to go with what you were saying, I have the stats here. This was playing as the easiest hole on the day for round two anyway, um, at .22 strokes under par. So just like what you were saying, yeah. these guys should yep, be that tracks trying out. to get the birdie. Yeah, because if you look Craig here, Dylan manager. and Craig, yeah, Dylan and Craig here, they're, they're not even really attacking the second third of the fairway. They're just getting into a nice position to make sure they can get up and down, take the birdie, keep it moving. It's good golf. I mean, that's how that's that's how you need to play the holes with a lot of trouble. Just play point to point, keep them safe, take your birdie. Absolutely. You see, Phil got off the fairway early there, you know, and and now he's uh, he's got some work to do. Chuck swings it out wide, hits another tree, it looked like, in the middle. That's a good-looking shot, and he'll have an outside look for the birdie even, you know, even from right there. So we'll see if maybe he can squeeze one in. Oh. Uh, Dylan hits a tree there. That wasn't Dylan. That was nope, Phil. that was Phil. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was – you're all right. You're all right. We, it's definitely the, the gray, the gray shirts sweaters got, yeah. aren't helping. <laughs> gray sweaters aren't helping, but – here we go, and then uh, well, this is Craig off the tee. This, this is a really nice uh, landing zone here. Probably a, a zone or something, something zone-like up to the basket. All right, good bid. Good bid. Good bid. He's just going to have to take his medicine on this one, and... The next stretch of holes here, I, I would say, are also, uh, you know, certainly very, very attackable. We'll, we'll hope, I guess it remains to see if they're birdieable. Oh, Chuck with a fine bid from about 40. Just off the front of the cage. That's a nice putt. Nice putt for birdie with Dylan. We can see the leaves blowing. There is some wind today. We, we couldn't quite tell out in the field. Maybe from their throws we could. Couldn't see much without the leaves on the trees but it was a bit breezy at times on this round so that'll be play a factor to uh to these guys play absolutely craig and, just and, missed and, his. and craig craig told me to thank you for bringing up the wind right there uh when he did <laughs> he really he really appreciates you mentioning that yes everybody a little worse so far through Five holes, uh, Chuck holding on even so far. And what do we have on, on hole five, Adam? All right, so hole five uh, is right there, par three, 300 feet. Uh, I suspect we're going to see some of the wide forehand hyzer uh, that plays effectively down the road you see out to the left, uh, or somebody might just try to attack it. There's, there's plenty of airspace uh, left and right of center if you want to go right up the gut. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking we're going to see some big swinging forehands here just like this. Let's see if that hooks back up, though. I think that's going to stay off oh. to the left. Uh, my guess here is he's about pin high, maybe 60 left. Is the road OB on this? The road is not OB. Okay. That's a little tighter. Yeah, definitely more of a natural OB philosophy here at this course. Very, very few spots that are that are hard OB on, on most tournaments, and then occasionally uh, event specific OB throughout the year, but not not the normal fit, not the normal layout. Gotcha. Craig overturned that one just a little bit. Agreed, and it looks like Phil's going to try to show us that backhand route. OB 
get around. Ah, uh, big. Like kick I said, you got to be left. You got to be left. Yeah. Big. You got to be. You got to be <laughs> left or right or center on that. Uh, on the, on those fairways there. But again, looks like he was able to uh, work it back up to the basket from off the fairway. Hopefully, no damage done. Phil's scramble rate is skyrocketing at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's just tapping the stats. I don't know. I'll ask him next time I see him. <laughs> oh, Chuck. Oh, Chuck might take that in. Really good bid. Greg from All probably right. outside Safe circle layup. two there. Just take his par and move along. Come on. Dylan with a good run. Oh! Ooh. Dylan. Dylan giving it everything but the last inch. That's all it needed. It was there. So it looks like we'll have a, a card full of pars here by my count. I think that's right. That happens to work out because this hole played exactly even par for the field today. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, it does look very gettable, but there is also some trouble high, right, and left. So it, it, it's still a good quality golf shot where you got to pick a side. And sometimes that two-hole option makes it hard to actually commit to one of them. Yeah, and the forehand for, for Dylan and Craig looked like they didn't get the skip they were expecting and left them, you know, 40 or 50 instead of 20 feet that they're probably looking for. Exactly. And at hole six, we're back again, part three. 306 feet and again you can uh, work a forehand out to the left although there's some earlier trees you're going to have to miss on this line uh there is a beautiful right hand backhand hyzer all the way down the right uh but there are some guardian trees very well placed up by the basket uh and dylan looks like he's going to crack the code and go overhand again so let's see how uh how this plays out he way what you up said. In the air. i'm going over the top is what he says <laughs> That's fine. And, uh, you know, he, yeah. he probably covered two thirds of the fairway and, you know, maybe give himself an outside look. So now the forehand line, are you saying way left out over the road or split those close Either. island of trees on the left? The, the video is not okay. necessarily showing you, but you can actually work something past the first bunker on the right that is still flexing to the left. Let's see. Here it is. No, nope, it looks there like it, it went up okay. the middle. But that's about it. You can you can hit that line so that it flexes out back to the road and then still finishes with an overstable enough disc. But I think Phil's going to show us that right-hand hyzer. It's sort of like a laser line. Let's see if you can find it. Oh, That's correct beautiful. me. Sorry, okay. Phil. Sorry, Phil. He just went with the gut shot, and one tree to beat, he would have been right under the basket. So there's one more line to the right of that that he could have gone. That's right, yeah. But like I said, you can fly uh, 280 feet perfect and still hit a guardian tree and leave yourself an outside look, so... Right. It looks like all these guys are probably right outside the range where they can really give it a, a decent run. So Especially if the wind be... is up, like you were saying. Yeah, and I, I think in this direction, it, it seems to be a headwind, if I remember correctly. Maybe a head cross. Oh, nice. Girl. That sounds right. You can't tell from the uh, from the course as you're looking at it, but we are we are on the ocean right here. The, the the beach you can walk into the water is a half a mile further into the park. So, wind and Long Island and Hexer, uh, it's all one thing. So for the local guys here, the wind is is just that that's literally par for the course with the wind. Uh, <laughs> we call it home field. We we try to call it home field advantage, but uh, well, after it, looking it really, at some of the holes. <laughs> I was gonna. I was gonna say I, I. I have to come up and play it because it looks like a very enjoyable course. But then you just said wind is normal, and very. I still haven't figured wind out yet. Uh, it just. Uh, it, it makes my game sort of uh, explode, and it's not fun. No, no, it is not. But it's. Uh, it's something you just. You know, if you play in the Northeast, you play in the winter. If you play on Long Island, you play in the wind. You. You. You, you got to do it. Hole seven here, par three, 290 feet. One of my favorite holes, uh, no no disrespect to every other hole. Uh, I'm hoping we're gonna see a couple of gut shots, mid ranges, right up the gut that are, uh, it's about as pretty a line as you can throw. And uh, and there's also some forehands you can work out either early or halfway down the fairway. Dylan, it looks like flipping up, probably a putter even maybe. Uh, he's through all the danger, but again, he's probably at that circle to his edge looking at a, uh, an open putt. It looked like he got a little more elevation on that than he wanted to, which caused it to hyzer out a little more. 
Sounds about right. Chuck looks like he might be following him. Or. Oh, nice flip. Or not. Yeah, surprisingly straight for how high that went. Must have been a very flippy distance thrower or putter, like you said. I think so. Oh, come back and get around that tree at the end. Big skip. There it is. That's All right, it. There you go. Nice shot by Craig. That's, That's a beautiful, beautiful flex forehand. It makes the fairway so much wider, too. It shapes up very nicely. Oh, right at it. Don't turn. Don't turn. You know, I think you beat the last bunker there. I think he might be in the circle. It's going to be close. Oh, that look at that wind right uh, now. Oh, yeah. So he made it down that tree fairway, and now he's got this open look. There are some overhanging branches, so the ceiling can come into play. You watched the wind take that one. Good bid. Very, very, uh, very aggressive bid. Yeah, I think those, I think those there. limbs hang, yeah, I think those limbs hanging over forced him to keep it lower than he was going to need to if he wanted to find the chain. Oof. You can just, you can really see what the wind's doing on these putts. Yeah, it's just, it's just picking them up off. Picking them up and floating, that was hard to say. <laughs> and when you turn around and you do it with a tailwind, it's going to slam it down, which is what Chuck yeah. just uh, experienced there. We've all been where Phil, uh, where, um, sorry, we've all been where Chuck was there. Turn to your card and say, can I tap that out? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I want to get away from here as fast as possible and onto the next hole and see yep. if I can exercise my short memory. Dylan staring that down until it finishes, uh, settles in the basket. <laughs> and Craig uh, should be tapping in his two here. Wow, that that was a beautiful shot. Yeah, yeah, really well measured there. I want to I want to tell you guys that's his pink justice, but it could also be his own. But it's definitely an overstable, you know, mid to approach disc, uh, and he just has such amazing control on the forehand with those so very happy to see him get that one yeah wind didn't seem to affect him too much on this hole um, but we will move on to hole eight we thought the wind was a factor in the woods now we're back out into the <laughs> field let's see how, how it affects these players on hole eight par three 329 feet it's pretty much straight from the tee that we were looking at in the first shot that we just saw there is the couple trees on the left side where if they wind up over there We'll have to contend with, but other than that, bunkers on the right side and long. Come back. We'll, uh, yeah, and some trouble Craig they picking up, up right where he left off. Yeah, Craig picking up right where he left off. It looks like he just went with a faster disc through the exact same shape and uh, gave himself a gave himself a good look at the two. I wonder if he pushed it deep on purpose. Which way is the wind blow on this hole? I believe Ooh. it was a tailwind today. That sounds about right. That was a beautiful throw from Dylan. I'm, I'm thinking the way that finished, he might have gone mid-range there. And I'll, I'll tell you guys, that, that's a pro-level shot right there to work the mid-range down. And uh, Phil was a couple of degrees yeah. of, of hyzer away from doing the exact same thing, it looks like. And let's see what Chuck's got for us. I've noticed throughout the round, Chuck has a unique form. He doesn't put the disc in his throwing hand until the very last second. I've never seen that before. That is, you, you and me both, and, and he and I actually spoke <laughs> about that a couple months ago. We, uh, he's, uh, he'll, he'll, he plays his rounds during the week most often, and I got to play with him a couple of times uh, a couple of months ago. And the, ooh, oh. great bid from uh, that is that is jail over there too. So the fact he was able to work it back to the basket was nice. But I asked him about it, and he said it's uh, you know he's playing with different things. Like I said, he is he is he's not brand new to disc golf by any stretch, but he is definitely new to tournaments. And uh, you know you can see he's really working on things. He said it helped him with the timing, and uh, here he is on the lead card. So I'm not uh, I'm not here to tell anybody what they're doing is wrong if what they're doing right. is working. And speaking of work, and we finally see Craig land one of these turbo putts. There you go. Oh, <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> Dylan's going to try it. <laughs> he 
thought about it, uh, and then he also thought better of it. Yeah. Nice Didn't pot. Need it. Didn't need a great birdie 25 there. Twenty-five feet. And this was a great card to follow. Obviously, we, I was one of the camera ops for this, and these guys were, you know, fun, fun to follow. They were they razzing each other a little bit, so I think that was a little bit of a Dylan and Craig bantering back and forth, which is just great. These guys are having fun out there while they're playing. You love to see it. Which is, yeah, it's always nice because it is competitive, but you can get some cards that are way too serious. So to see lead cards still out here having a good time always makes a better watch on our side too. Yeah, and I won't speak for Dylan, but no one's ever accused Craig of being too serious, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely not. And we'll see if that continues on hole nine. It's a par four, 474 feet. These guys looking like they're probably just going to lay up to this gap if they really wanted to. I think the distance uh, allows to try to go through it. And then once you get through, there's this circle of trees that surrounds the basket, making it for a very picturesque uh, green that they'll be trying to get to. Yeah, it's a beautiful hole. The forehand uh, Craig setting up, I think he's going to show you that layup to the landing zone. You can kind of see naturally where it, uh, it sort of sets up right where, right where this is about to land, if I'm being honest. That, that's 1A right there. That's where you want to put it. That should make for a very manageable upshot. Uh, hopefully let him get his birdie. Dylan, I and think he's going to show you how to get there a different way. Yeah. Yeah, straight. The hardest shot in disco. We spoke <laughs> earlier about the first round of this tournament was the Thrive. A lot of these par fours and some of the par fives, we could still see the, the temporary tee pads that we see here, the flags. That seemed to be the aiming point for these guys. So almost just cutting the holes in half they did in the first round are now working to their advantage because then they have the same shots in the second round. Absolutely. Beautiful turnover here from Chuck, also finding the spot. So, yeah, uh, what you're seeing here is pretty typical of, uh, you know, an open-level card. Phil, you putting those long legs to good use. Uh, again, strong ultimate background. So you can literally just picture him throwing this shot around a defender if you want. And let's see if he can get the turn he needs. Uh, last branch. Ugh. Last branch. I think he'll be able to get up and down to, uh, to save his far from there, though. Craig should have a really nice look for the uh, flex forehand here. Oh, I'm worried about that height. Uh, I'm worried about that height. Uh, a, a, a line drive, you know, something with a nice hard skip finish is really probably the, uh, the prescribed line. Chuck there, you can see... Yeah, he faded out, but he's going to have a really clean backdoor look there, so hopefully he can make something happen. Yeah, Adam, you were talking about that, that low line drive skip. It's actually a shot I just added, grabbing a, a firebird, a felon, and yep. baby flicking it, but counting on the big flare skip around a corner. It really is a game-changing shot. It, it, you know, that, that utility upshot, whatever you, you like, you pick your favorite overstable sharp edge disc. Uh, you know, those discs, they don't want to fly. They're trying to get to the ground, and that's what you want. So very, very useful. Very useful shot. The Chuck from probably just outside the circle. Ah, it's a good-looking oh. bid. Kept it right on the pole. Dylan probably just a little bit closer than Chuck was, but from a similar spot. I don't know if those branches hanging over are in his way. I take it back. They are very much in his way. <laughs> catches his disc. Uh, yeah. No two meter rule, I gather. No two meter rule on this coach. <laughs> well, that's... You know, I'll take a moment here if I can, real quick, just to uh, to point out. So, uh, disc golf on Long Island is is underdeveloped, and it's something we're working very hard to to correct here. But we definitely want to thank. Ernie Martin and Neil Dambra for, for getting this course in the ground for us and for, for being champions of disc golf here on Long Island. Uh, they, they really put down some strong roots and a good foundation, and we're just trying to build off of that. So thank you, Ernie and Neil, for, uh, for giving us this, this course because we love it, and we're really happy to have it. Uh, whole it 10, I'll just jump in here for you, Dave. Yep, go yeah, for thanks. it. Yeah, thanks. Hole 10, we're going to be looking at a huge right-hand backhand hyzer, trying to get as far down this gap you're looking at here as possible. Second shot with the right-hand finish, we'll probably see some turnovers in forehand. The three is an absolutely amazing birdie, I promise you. I know the distance doesn't seem exorbitant, but the, the shape, the two shapes you have to throw to get the three here, you, you've really earned it. Four, 
four is going to keep you in line with the rest of the field, I imagine. I, I bet your stats are going to back that up. I bet it's playing about a maybe a quarter stroke over, if I had a guess. Uh, pretty close. Point one one for this for this group. Again, this is just MPO, so. Uh, oh, okay. 4.1, yeah, four point one one in the second round. A couple of birdies, couple of bogeys. Yep, that sounds about right. Uh, that was Dylan getting around the corner just fine. Let's see if Phil, you know, Phil throws the shot a lot. Let's see if he can work something further down. The problem is the far side tree that you're looking at there sticks out over the fairway. So if you if you don't get it on hyzer fast enough, it's very easy to throw to the far side trees and just get knocked down. It looks like the play though is to flirt with it. That way you keep it up and set up that second shot, right? Yeah, if you if you you want to cheat as much distance as you can off that first shot to make this a more man. This is going to be a, a huge forehand if you can get this all the way down there. It looks good to start. Uh, Burned it over just a touch. And just a little bit, just a little bit. And the wind is usually, again, going to be a huge factor. This is like an actual wind tunnel you're, you're looking down. And it could be a headwind or a tailwind on any given day, but it, it, there's going to be wind. Chuck trying to show you the backhand turnover route. Again, the ceiling is going to make that a little bit hard at that height. Um, let's see if, uh, if Phil can work out. Roller is going to be a real popular play from this side of the fairway. Oh, there we go. And on cue. <laughs> and on cue. And a really good looking roller, huh? Wow. Now Not that. bad. I don't know about how close that got him, but I imagine it was it was getting close to the circle there. Yeah, it definitely looks like the wind's burning these turnovers into the ground. Agreed. And and again with the limited ceiling, there's there's not enough time for it to then flex back out once it starts dipping. We'll flirt with the yeah. Yep. There's Dylan from too far out to run it, wow. but he'll take his car and, and keep it moving. I'm going to say it was a tailwind with the way that thing got knocked down. I think so. Right, giving good it a... Run, good you know, Giving it a scare. Giving it a scare. Let's see. Chuck here. Oh, Phil's roller must have really got up there. That, that's excellent. Oh, another oh, good run from Chuck. He's right on line. He's right on line. And here's uh, and here's Phil with that roller, probably from just outside the circle. Oh. Uh. Inches well, low. You, you know, if uh, when the tall guy misses low, that's that's yeah. that's a bummer. When I that's when I miss low, I just say I, I just say I wish I was taller. But when the tall guy misses <laughs> low, what can he do? And uh, so hole 10 is obviously the 11th hole and the end of our first half of this final round of the tournament. Um, Adam, tell us real quick about St. Baldrick's Foundation and what people can do to help them out. Yeah, thank you so much. So this is our big charity event for the year. Uh, and this being the seventh annual, uh, we've been partnering for the last, uh, I'm gonna say five or six years with the St. Baldrick's Foundation. They fund research and development for cancer treatment, specifically for pediatric cancer. And uh, for those watchers who are familiar, uh, this is the charity wherein the volunteers, not only do they raise money, but many of us will shave our heads or in some cases our beards uh, in solidarity with those kids who have to uh, endure treatment. Uh, and just to, just to, because I can't help but brag, but as, we, as we're talking right now, uh, we're at about $14,000 raised for this year. And that fundraising wow. link is going to stay open for the rest of the year. Uh, 2020 uh, was kind of a double year for fundraising purposes. We got up over $20,000. We're probably somewhere in the fifty dollars to $60,000 range as a club raising money for the St. Baldrick's organization. And I I don't gloat about much, but I will gloat about this. This is this is something really special to have been a part of over the years. And uh, that is, you know, if anyone is looking to support, please, uh, you know, you just let us know. We'd be happy to get you involved. Yep, that is terrific. And that link will be down in the description of this video. And thank you all for watching the front 11 of this tournament. We're going to head over to the back 11. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to Heiser Media's channel. Uh, thank you to Rick and Adam for accommodating with me. And we'll see you over on the back 11.